our next couple of artworks for the day. This piece is called Earth's Creation by Emily Kame Kungwari. Um, she was a native artist that worked out of Central Australia. She was actually born around 1910. Um, she was part of an Aboriginal community that was taken over by European pastoralist settlers around 1920. So basically, people from the communities were um, indentured servants, basically serfs, to a lot of the Europeans that had basically come in and claimed that they owned the land. So these lands were not liberated until 1976 when Kangare um, suddenly found herself able to live independently. So at that time, um, the artist had established herself in the community as a respected elder. She was a person that was responsible for creating body art for ceremonies in a lot of Aboriginal communities. Creating art on the body itself using pigments is an important form of cultural expression. Um, and then also creating artwork on materials like stone and um, textiles was extremely important in this community. So a gallery actually delivered painting supplies for the community to experiment with in the 1980s, so shortly after this liberation that happened in the 70s. And they decided to put on this exhibit to um, create exposure for these communities and to bring their artistic expression to the forefront of the world's attention and awareness. So this resulting exhibit gained um, critical acclaim basically overnight, and Emily Kange Kanwari became a pretty highly sought after artist in, this, um, in, the, in the greater world sphere. So not only in her like, community in Central Australia, but became like a more highly demanded artist. So this painting, Earth's Creation, actually sold for a record $1 million in 2007. So um, this painting consists of four panels and the entire piece is about 25 feet wide in its entirety. So I included this image down here to give you a sense of the scale of this piece. So this painting in particular is an abstraction. You'll, you'll probably notice a lot of similarities to the expressionist movement that was happening in the West around the early and mid 20th century. So this painting in particular is meant to represent the green time. So this is the period of lushness experienced in Australia after the rainy season. The land becomes saturated with water and then all of a sudden everything is blooming. So that is basically um, one of the reasons that we're seeing an overwhelming amount of greens and yellows and browns. These are colors that you would expect to see in an Australian landscape. So this painting was created using several layers of dots. So this technique of dot painting has been used in Aboriginal art for tens of thousands of years. Um, there have been examples of rock art found um, that date back to 20,000 BCE and earlier that demonstrate this technique. So what's really interesting when you look at the progression of Emily Kame Kungwari's paintings, um, particularly with these kinds of acrylics, is that her paintings um, towards the beginning of her career resemble pretty closely the kinds of artwork that you would see um, on textiles and on bodies of Aboriginal individuals. Um, typically, they have these flat fields of color in the background, so that's represented by these blues, um, and then these linear elements with dots layered on top. So this one is a little bit um, more chaotic. You can see her trying to kind of like branch out from this kind of almost canonized style by creating these layering dots right here. And of course, by the 90s, around eight to 10 years later, she is basically allowing herself to create these artworks where she's not confined to these flat fields and lines and dots. She is layering these elements on top of one another. The lines are not necessarily following these linear um, kind of like organized patterns. They're scattering across the canvas. She's also varying her color palettes. Uh, instead of using colors that are probably straight from the tube like they are here, she's using blending, she's using layering. There's actually a lot of similarities to Basquiat's piece in this sense. And when you look at this piece as well, you can see the use of brush strokes 
um, in the expressions, especially um, in the midground of these different kinds of shrubberies and greens. So there's actually a couple of um, videos and photos online of Kunguari working. Instead of having like a massive like wall or easel that she worked on her pieces for, she put them on the ground and she just sat herself down and like took one of those like dipping brushes, the ones that are kind of like spongy on the ends and just basically sat there and stamped the canvas. And then she would actually like walk onto the canvas to get the parts in the middle and stamped those as well. It's very fun. Our next piece is from the Women of a Law series. It's called Rebellious Silence by Sharin Nishat. So Nishat was born and spent her early life in Iran. She eventually moved to the United States to pursue her education when a political tensions arose in Iran. You've probably heard of the Iranian Revolution of 1979. This was basically, like in a nutshell, a time when there was lots of political tensions in Iran. There was this um, massive radical switch to an Islamic state rather than a more secular state. So there was this sort of like militant Islam that took over. So this Women of Allah series includes photographic images that depict features that Westerners frequently associate with Muslims and particularly Muslim women at this point in time. There's a couple of kind of like archetypal things that she focuses on in these kinds of images. The gaze, G-A-Z-E, calligraphy, um, weapons and guns, as well as the veil. So the, the gaze here is seen as a confrontational act of the viewer. We've talked about the female gaze before within the context of other works, like uh, Cindy Sherman's Untitled Number 228, like Manny's Olympia. These are a couple of great pieces to reference if you were to ever do a comparison essay on this piece. Um, this piece is meant to suggest this notion that the camera and the, the artist's hand have been used to exploit and commodify women's bodies before. We have a history of the reclining female nude. We also have this history of using women's bodies in advertisements. At this point in time, it would have been relatively recent to use that medium. Remember that we talked about Woman One, that piece that we covered from Abstract Expressionism, this, this notion of this kind of like almost scary, menacing looking woman that is being used to advertise products and is kind of staring at the viewer in this kind of empty looking way. So in this sense, when the woman is staring back at you, especially in this very frontal pose and with her body covered the way that it is, there's this notion that the, the woman in the photo is taking control. So there's also calligraphy. So we've talked about calligraphy before within the context of Eastern and Middle Eastern art. So this is in the Farsi script right here, which is the Persian language. Um, and this text contains a poem written by an Iranian author entitled Allegiance with Wakefulness. So this poem concerns the bravery of martyrdom or sacrificing oneself for their beliefs. So martyrdom is one of the themes that is kind of overarching in this Women of the Law series. The woman, of course, is also holding a gun, which is bisecting this extremely balanced, symmetrical composition here. So, of course, firearms you can see as a reference to violence. So in this particular case, it's a reference to social and political turmoil occurring in Iran in the 1970s and 80s, as well as aspects of control and martyrdom. Another aspect of Middle Eastern culture that we see represented here is the veil. So this particular veil is called a chador. It's a garment that is meant to conceal the entire body except for the, hand, or except for the hands and the face. So these kinds of veils historically were used to keep women's bodies from being seen as sexual objects. Now, a lot of um, perceptions in the West color these sorts of veils as being oppressive towards women. You've probably seen rhetoric um, before from Western feminists that talk about these kinds of garments being oppressive towards women. Um, to an Iranian audience, and particularly to Shirin Nashat, um, this 
kind of veil is seen as an expression of faith and control and choice over one's body, and he was permitted to look upon it. So typically, when a woman um, in one of these communities went out in public, when she was in the presence of men that she was not related to, she was expected to wear this sort of a veil to divert the male gaze. However, in this case, there's a suggestion that she has a choice in whether or not to wear this veil, and basically she controls like who is able to, to look upon her body. Here are a couple of other pieces um, that Shirin Nishat has done. She's also done a lot of video work recently. There was a video that she did in the late, two or late 2000s called Women Without Men that she references in this TED Talk. Um, it is a little bit long, it's about 10 minutes long, but she's an extremely eloquent and moving speaker. She talks a lot about women being the center of political change in Iranian history, as well as this fight for democracy that they've been fighting for for generations. It's a really fantastic video. She's a great speaker. I highly suggest seeing it. Our next piece is called En la Barbaria No Se Ora, which basically um, translates to In the Barbershop We Don't Cry, or No Crying in the Barbershop. So this piece is by Puerto Rican artist Pepon Osorio, um, who lives and works in New York. So he's actually a trained social worker and sociologist, and he uses his professional and personal experiences with the um, Latino community um, in America to construct these sorts of installations. So this particular installation was located in Hartford, Connecticut, um, and constructed in collaboration with the Puerto Rican community that lived in that area at this particular point in time in the mid-90s. So he accompanied these um, installation efforts with workshops. So this installation depicts the interior of a barber shop with lots of different paraphernalia also involved. So paraphernalia um, can also be like interpreted as kitsch or um, in Spanish chucherias. There's also a myriad of video screens, so you can kind of see this little um, miniature television screen right here. There's also others um, dispersed throughout the installation. Um, there's lots of images on the walls, um, both photographic and painted. Um, there is also this um, overarching theme of machismo, which is this Latino conception of masculine pride and masculinity. So there's lots of different themes of male rites of passage that are being referenced in this particular work. There's references to like the barber shop being a place of of meeting for and and a place of like masculinity um, for men in the community. There's also references to things like circumcision, circumcision, which is seen as a rite of male passage. So there's also lots of images of male virility. You can see that in this image right here, we have this contrast of roses, um, which are typically seen, and flowers are typically seen as more like feminine aspects, more feminine visual elements. And then you have these bullets down here, which are quite phallic in nature. Um, there's also images on the walls of prominent um, Latino men and Latino American men, um, a lot of whom are extremely muscular and kind of portray this image of masculinity. There's also hobby items um, interspersed throughout the installation that are associated with masculinity. There's seats from like sports cars, there's hubcaps, um, sports memorabilia like baseballs, um, there's male action figures. But in addition to these kinds of more masculine elements, there's also these more like quote unquote feminine elements that are being injected as well and operating kind of in contrast to these masculine elements. There's, as you can see, there's lace, there's tulle, um, there's flowers, kind of like more like kitsch that's associated with matronly elements that is operating in direct contrast to these masculine elements. 
So there's also, um, importantly, some imagery in this installation that challenges machismo, that challenges this notion of masculinity and who men are supposed to be and how they're supposed to act within their communities. So this is intending to critique this concept of machismo and its direct and indirect contributions to societal ills like homophobia, violence, infidelity, etc. So basically these elements of toxic masculinity that are contributing to ills in the community. So there's videos in the installation that show men crying. Um, there's these matronly kitches, kitsch items to, to show um, kind of like this um, contrast to masculinity. Um, there's these um, References to violence, again, for example, we have these kind of like phallic looking bullets on the wall. When you look at some other images from this installation, you again begin to get a sense of kind of like this contrasting of masculine and feminine imagery. Um, if you look at one of the barbershop chairs here, you can see again this, this lace and fake um, greenery, but you also see some knives right here, um, these comb picks, baseballs, and then in this particular photo you see a pool table, which is typically kind of like a, a dive bar, kind of like very masculine sort of thing. Um, one of my favorite details are the hubcaps on the walls. Um, you have this notion of like men being obsessed with their cars. Um, these are video screens right here. These are the kinds of screens that show things like um, videos of men crying. And then one of my favorite details are these trophies up here. So there's this notion of success and athletic athletic power that is also being referenced here. So Osorio has done lots of installation type work throughout his artistic career. Here's a couple of other pieces that he's done. Our final artist of the day is Michael Tuffery, who created this piece called Pispo Loa Afe, aka Corned Beef 2000. So uh, Michael Tuffery is of Polynesian descent. He, his family is from Samoa, and his work largely focuses on cultural, social, and environmental impacts of the West in Polynesian nations. So there's various issues that occurred as a result of Western occupation in these places. We have, of course, things like the, the more immediate things that happened, like disease and um, the communities being taken advantage of. Um, but there's also long-term effects of kind of like this, this imbalance that was imposed upon these island nations. Things like overfishing, um, which would in, then in turn affect food supply and quality. There was also pollution that was caused by livestock that were brought to these islands to provide food sources. They would produce lots of like manure waste that would bleed into the groundwater. Um, they would also require lots of grassland to graze on, so that required clearing away jungles and forests. And basically the fragility of these island ecosystems was really kind of like tested in these sorts of situations. So this is a life-sized sculpture, and it's one of many that Michael Tuffery has completed throughout his life. Um, and this w particular sculpture and many of others were actually created using these flattened corned beef tins. So corned beef is one of those items in a lot of Pacific Island communities that is seen as a hot commodity. It's one of those kind of like ideal kind of like high-end foods. It's kind of like how caviar is perceived in the West. Oftentimes, like at weddings and funerals, people would actually give corned beef and other canned meats to like the people who are being celebrated. They're relatively inexpensive imports and they become these like par integral parts of celebration and gift exchange. They're kind of like an, Im they're kind of like an, an item to symbolize wealth and power in a sense. You've probably heard of this um, kind of like the importance of, of Spam, um, which is that canned meat product um, in Hawaii. Um, one of my favorite things about going to Hawaii is like going to Costco and you'll see like these massive pallets of just Spam and you would never see that in Southern California here in the States. It's, 
it's a it's a very kind of like cultural thing this importance of canned meats particularly because it was so hard to get fresh um kind of like non-fish meat um in these island communities so canned foods as well as cows produce a lot of waste that ends up reducing the quality of the environment and damaging the ecosystem so there's certainly a commentary here as well as this intention to reduce kind of like the pollution that's going into the environment by transforming it into artwork um, there's also this problem that canned foods have um, introduced to a lot of these island communities which is contributing to health problems like obesity so it's also reduced the need for traditional methods of collected collecting and preparing foods, so traditional agriculture, fishing, cooking. So these things that have been c considered kind of like elements of culture for these communities are disappearing because of the introduction of these easy to prepare foods. So this sculpture actually has wheels on its feet so that it can be moved. Um, there's been several documented um, cases of Michael Tuffery having volunteers operate these bowls and like these kind of like battles with one another. Sometimes he'll place fireworks inside the bodies to make it appear that the bulls are breathing fire. Um, he's used these bulls to actually reduce tensions among Pacific Islanders that have um, kind of like created this diaspora in the greater Pacific. So a lot of these um, people and their descendants have had to move to um, larger cities um, as a result of being displaced from their island communities. And because there's lots of um, these members of different communities in one place, um, a lot of times tensions would arise in the communities. So this is a great video that is showing how Michael Tuffery is reducing tension in these communities and having like the people channel their frustration and tension into these kind of like modes of artistic expression. One of my favorite things, one of my favorite details about Michael Tuffery's work um, is this element of community that he is intending to create in his work. So not only is he trying to educate his community about like the importance of sustainable agricultural and food production um, and like community togetherness, um, but he is creating artwork that is intended to have everybody kind of like participate in this this new mode of cultural expression. So this asiasi, this yellowfin tuna actually doubles as a smoker so you can actually stick fish inside the body cavity of this sculpture and cook it. So he actually did have a cookout with this sculpture where he cooked the food inside of it and served it to members of his community.